All right, great. So um, I've been playing around with the title. Uh, so now it's a bit of a um, limerick, uh, let's intend to end unintended pregnancy. Um, so like Dr. Madsen said, um, I'm currently out in California now, um, but this entire project and effort takes place uh, where I did my first two years of residency at New Hanover Regional Medical Center in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, so I guess uh, I'd like to start by just highlighting how unintended pregnancy surrounds my life. I am a product of unintended pregnancy. Um, I wake up every morning next to my uh, girlfriend who is a product of unintended pregnancy. I walk to the kitchen next to my roommate, who's my younger brother, who also is a product of unintended pregnancy. His kid, who's seven years old, my nephew stays with us, and he is a product of unintended pregnancy. Um, and then I go to work and see dozens of women and um, treat and manage their pregnancies that are often products of unintended pregnancy. So it is everywhere. Um, and this is a bit of maybe of an ideal, but I think it's a reasonable question and goal. Shouldn't women be able to choose when they become pregnant? I think they should. I think most women think they should. I think most healthcare providers think that they should. So um, how big of a burden is this? It's, it's quite significant. Um, in the United States, currently about 45 in 1,000 women of reproductive age um, experience an unintended pregnancy every year. Um, those numbers are declining over the past several, maybe the last two decades um, significantly. Uh, a lot of that is due to kind of the reacceptance of long acting uh, reversible contraceptives, such as the uh, intrauterine device, the IUD, or the subdermal implant, like the next one on. Um, but in the end, uh, about 45% of all pregnancies in the United States every year are unintended. So this um, issue is very much dictated by socioeconomic status and race with those um, below the poverty line and those of Black and Hispanic race um, most significantly influenced. Um, and, and the burden is very real and um, not very well understood, but in looking at this chart, which highlights a lot of the kind of the progress and the issues of unintended pregnancies worldwide, I'm gonna highlight a few. So here we are with unintended pregnancies, which would be defined as mistimed or unwanted. Um, and then in the event that this pregnancy continues and um, does not result in an abortion, um, there are associations with increased substance use during pregnancy, late arrival to prenatal care, um, and that has been associated with low birth weight as well as um, higher incidence of prematurity. Um, and then that also has been associated with uh, decreased breastfeeding, um, and decreased um, preventative care for newborns uh, as well as the mothers. And then that can lead to child development issues. Um, and these are all things that I think everybody um, would be concerned about. The burden is also financial. Um, as you can see, this is a... Uh, uh, graph of the United States and highlighting the percentage of unplanned births um, that were publicly funded in 2010. As you can see, it's it's um, pretty significant. About over 60% of um, un of uh, births across the country are publicly funded. In the, um, in North Carolina, the percent is above 60% of unplanned births were publicly funded. And conservatively, uh, this amounts to about $15.5 billion of taxpayer money that is spent on unintended pregnancy during the year 2010. So 
really the solution um, is multifaceted and there are a variety of um, kind of political and soci social reasons why this is now the case. But one thing we can do is provide easier access to contraceptive care. So the barriers to contraceptive access are numerous, but to highlight a few, uh, lack of trained providers is, is a real issue. Um, at the moment, uh, a survey was done nationally in 2015 that showed that only really 30% of community health centers provided um, same day access to uh, IUDs or Nexplanons. Oh, sorry, I meant to go back. Um, bias and coercion is a real issue that is um, becoming more and more um, documented as far as women being able to choose the type of contraception that they actually desire and a provider respecting that. And then there's issues surrounding billing and coding um, and stocking, which um, in the world of electronic medical records and the complexities of the um, payer system that we have in this country, it can be very challenging to uh, have access to contraceptive, all the contraceptive options in all the settings that um, they should be able to be provided. And this is where I became um, interested in kind of developing my project was where um, we, as in the residency program, we have access to um, a variety of contraceptive options in the hospital setting, um, but not all. And so when I'm working in the hospital and I have a uh, postpartum mom and her baby and I'm going over the various options that she can do, um, I'm not able to provide, I was not able to provide the IUD. Um, which is one of the most effective forms of contraception. Um, and I found it perplexing because in the clinic, when I'm talking to the same patient who's, um, you know, we'll assume that she is uh, a Medicaid patient and um, uh, that's how this pregnancy is getting paid for, I have the ability to provide her with every type of contraceptive option, including the IUD. Um, and then I'm looking at uh, why, if that's capable, if I'm capable of being able to provide these options in the hospital. And there is very clear, um, you know, documentation for reimbursement for long-acting reversible contraceptions in the hospital setting. Um, and so I went to my uh, our our biller um, for the resident program and. I was unable to get a clear answer or to fix this issue. Um, essentially, the explanation that I got was because the IUD is getting placed inside the uterus and the baby is also coming out of the uterus that it can't be billed under the same charge. Um, and I did not understand why that was the case. And um, I didn't have any resources beyond the biller to figure out how to fix this. Um, and so then I began looking at um, outside partners and networking to try to fix this problem. Um, and that's when I ran into uh, Upstream USA. This is a nonprofit uh, national organization that provides a variety of services um, with the goal of providing um, same day contraception um, to any woman who desires it. Um, and particularly of um, importance to me was this, this billing and electronic, electronic medical record um, assistance that I desperately needed. So um, their methods have been highly successful um, they started out in Delaware and within the three year period from 2014 to 2017, they decreased the rate of unintended pregnancies by 25%. Um, even more kind of profound was they were able to 
decrease the number of abortions in the state of Delaware um, by more than any other state across the country. And that's despite Delaware opening up three new family planning abortion clinics um, and none closing. So uh, their um, um, process usually takes about two years with various phases that involve training of providers doing a needs assessment um, and then um, implementing uh, their uh, recommendations. And then in the end, it leads to a period of sustainability where they track for two years after the intervention to make sure that um, the um, healthcare centers are able to continue providing these services and maintain um, this improved access to contraception. So um, I had several meetings with uh, Danica Mills, who is the North Carolina representative um, for Upstream USA, um, and they were fantastic. Um, They also have over a dozen North Carolina partners, and um, I was very excited to get new Hanover um, to join in with these other agencies in this partnership. So uh, here is a hierarchical kind of view of my hospital um, entities. Um, I am this little OBGYN resident down in the bottom left corner and I enlisted a kind of an OBGYN faculty advisor who um, expressed interest in participating in this um, process. And we had meetings with uh, Danica, the upstream USA representative and left those meetings feeling um, pretty enthusiastic with the plan for my um, advisor to uh, engage the necessary people to sign um, a an agreement um, between the hospital and upstream. Um, weeks turned into months, and I we I never did not hear back and was not able to um, secure that. And so I then decided to engage. Um, one of the graduate medical education vice president. um, uh, And in that, I tried to get that agreement um, signed as that was the the highest ranking member that I really knew within the hospital um, system. And um, that's kind of where I am right now. Um, There's a variety of things that have happened. COVID is very real and it's reasonable to say that that uh, could have been a factor. Um, We have a new um, partnership uh, between New Hanover and Novant as well as the UNC School of Medicine um, that made, made, you know, signing a kind of a contract between another entity um, maybe a little more difficult. And then I moved. Um, So that made it difficult for me to follow up um, with uh, kind of moving this um, uh, project forward. But in the end, I think it's very reasonable for me to kind of analyze where um, I could have um, maybe improved things. And I think it starts with just building a larger coalition. Um, So engaging other residents, engaging other faculty members within my department. and then also considering um, other um, groups within the hospital system that would benefit from this kind of service, such as the family medicine uh, residency, um, as well as maybe the midwifery service, um, as they do provide um, you know, perinatal care. And then with this larger coalition going to um, maybe my um, GME vice president at that point to try to get this contract sign and get this process going. So um, as far as directions for the project, you know, at this point, just establishing a stronger coalition is, would be kind of paramount. Um, And then implementing this process, which I think is, um, I just have a hard time seeing very many negatives at all. Um, And then sustainability so that um, this 
and provide the best access to contraceptive care for the um, women of uh, you know southeastern North Carolina. Um, so lessons I've learned, uh, you know, too much fiery red, I think, is a way to put it. Um, I think that being a little bit more um, sunshine yellow could have benefited me. Um, and then, um, but in the end, this is like a long process and this is a, a big undertaking and I, I am starting to kind of realize the, um, the nuances and the tact that's involved in making a big change um, within a, an organization um, as being a lower um, member in that kind of hierarchical tiered system. And so just staying positive and continuing to move forward. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, Danica. Um, she's been fantastic over at Upstream and I hope to continue working with her. And then um, Dr. Madsen, Dr. Greenblatt for um, kind of being creative uh, given all the things that have happened with um, my training and location. And then um, Caitlin was very helpful in um, talking with me and then getting me actually um, networked with uh, Danica in the first place.